Hi, this is Michael, G0POT, and in this video I'd like to bring you an overview of some of the features of the LNR Precision LD11. LNR seem to be really focusing on a specific target audience of QRP and portable enthusiasts with their portfolio of products, and the LD11 is no exception to this. I've taken this radio out portable for a SOTA activation, and if you haven't already seen that video, check out the link below in the comments section after you finish watching this, of course. So what is the LD11? Yeah, let's turn this on. It's an 11-band, that's HF and 6 meter, fully featured QRP transceiver, giving you SSB, CW, AM, FM, and Digi modes, all in a small and light package. There's no built-in ATU or battery, but this is pretty standard for QRP portable operators as it allows you to keep the weights down and choose the power option that suits your type of operation. The radio is, of course, available from LNR Precision in the US, but for UK and European hams, it's also available from the UK via Dennis at Kanga UK. I've put links in the comment section below pointing to both the LNR and Kanga UK websites. So let's look at this little radio and discuss some of the specs. I normally like to compare a radio to something you may have laying around at home to give you a good feel of the size and weight, but this one's kind of unique. It's designed with that trail friendly form factor and as a result is quite cuboid, but this works really well. The case is about 130 millimeters by 105 millimeters by 55 millimeters, or if you include the sticky out bits, it's 150 by 105 by 72 millimeters. Uh, that's for us European folk. Over the pond, the case is about five inches by four and one eighth inch by two and one eighth inch. The radio weighs about 580 grams or 20 ounces. And if you throw in the microphone and the power lead, that gives you a total weight of just under 750 grams or about 1.65 pounds. It has the flip out feet, which mean you can operate this on a bench or laying on the floor and four rubber feet to keep it nice and steady on flat surfaces. This form factor gives the designers much more room for controls, allows for a large display and minimizes the things that need to be tucked away in the menu system. We'll go through all the controls in a moment. On the left side of the radio, we have the sockets for the Morse key, straight and paddle, and the microphone. Now the microphone is very sturdy and actually sounds great. I've had some good compliments on the audio without having to fish for them. I do worry that this type of plug can put a bit of a strain on the socket. Not really an issue in the shack or if you're operating from a picnic table, but when the radio is on the ground and the lead is stretched a bit, it could cause problems. If you operate in this fashion, I'd recommend either replacing the straight plug with a 90 degree version or simply make a short extension. To be fair, I'd make the same comment for any other modern radio that uses this type of 3.5 millimeter jack plug for the microphone. The side tone control here is actually for the volume of the side tone. The frequency can be altered in the main menu. Finally, we have the headphone socket and a line in, line out socket that can be used for data modes. The LG11 even ships with the audio and USB cables required to connect the radio to a computer. Flipping the radio over to the right hand side, we have the power socket. This is a 5.5 by 2.5 millimeter socket and the radio can be fed from between 10.5 and 15 volts, which gives you a nice range of battery options. There's a built in 30 millimeter speaker, which gives plenty of volume and a push to talk switched output for switching external devices, probably things like uh, an external amplifier. The aerial connector now uses the ubiquitous BNC, which I love. And finally, there's a USB connector for computer control of the radio and for loading software updates. So let's take a closer look at the controls, starting with the left-hand side of the radio. It's all fairly self-explanatory. The push buttons are fairly basic with no tactile click, but they work perfectly well. So on the left-hand side, we have the on-off switch, the volume control, and the main tuning knob. The tuning knob can also be pushed to switch between tuning rates. There's a tuning lock, which is always a useful feature when operating portable, and this disables the tuning knob and the tuning step control. 
The blue function button gives you access to the secretary features of some of the other controls. The filter button switches through four separate filters and these differ depending on the mode selected. The filter selected is displayed in the bottom left of the large screen. Here you can see F1 which indicates filter 1, the widest setting is selected. And pressing the filter button or tuning knob scrolls through the four filter options. If you press the function button followed by the filter button you can view the preset bandwidth of each filter. Finally, doing this for filter 4 gives you the opportunity to modify the bandwidth because filter 4 is user configurable. The bottom left hand button controls the preamp and attenuator, and pressing it toggles through a sequence of attenuator on preamp on and then both preamp and attenuator off. This control gives you roughly a 16 dB boost or a 10 dB attenuation of the signal. The step button allows you to change between the tuning step rate. So in SSB this toggles through 10 Hz, 100 Hz, 1 kHz and 10 kHz and then back to 10 Hz. Finally, on the left hand side we have the mode and notch filter button. Pressing this toggles through the modes and the current mode is displayed in the top right of the screen. So as you can see we can step through lower sideband to CW, CW reverse, digi modes, AM, FM and USB. Pressing the blue button followed by the mode button toggles the notch filter on and off. Moving across to the right hand side of the radio we start with the up down band select buttons. Pressing the blue function button followed by the up button activates or deactivates the noise reduction. Similarly pressing the blue function button followed by the down button activates or deactivates the noise blanker. The level of the notch filter, the noise reduction and the noise blanker are all set in the menus. Selecting the receiver incremental tuning button displays the word RIT at the top of the screen with an asterisk next to it to indicate that the receive and transmit frequencies are the same. Using the tuning knob now alters the receive frequency but not the transmit frequency and the display uses a greater than or less than sign to indicate whether you are tuned above or below the transmit frequency. Pressing the RIT button toggles this feature on and off. The control is also used in conjunction with the blue function button to operate split mode. The bottom right hand button switches between VFOA and VFOB and the VFO in use is displayed in the top left of the screen. Finally, the LD11 has 100 memories for your favourite frequencies. Pressing memo immediately displays the current memory position and its frequency and to recall a stored memory you simply use the VFO knob to select the desired memory and then press the up arrow and the memo again to select it. Now let's look at the menu options. We start by selecting the menu button and immediately see the first menu option AGC speed displayed on the screen. Turning the VFO knob changes the setting of the selected option. We can now use the up and down buttons to scroll through the menu options. Next up is CW pitch which I have set at 650Hz and then CW speed which adjusts from 5 words per minute to 60 words per minute. Now there's a challenge for me to aim for. Let's turn that back down to something more achievable. CW weight can be set from 2 to 1 to 4.5 to 1, 3 to 1 is typical and the CW Vox controls the break-in delay in 100 millisecond steps. You can reverse your paddle should you need to and switch between simple for a straight key and auto for a paddle. The CW key also supports modes A and B. 
Next, the notch filter can be set from minus 6 dB to minus 40 dB, significantly attenuating birdies. And the noise blanket is adjustable from 4, a maximum, to 12, a minimum. Noise reduction can be set from 1, minimum, to 100, maximum. The S meter has two modes, a typical bar graph or the signal level in microvolts. Similarly on transmit, you can display the output as a bar graph or as a numerical value in watts. On transmit, you can either display the power out or the SWR. Built-in SWR metering is a really nice feature. The power out can be adjusted between about one watt and five watts. However, the range will depend on the voltage applied and thus the maximum power available. I got about eight watts out of my setup. The screen backlight can be persistent or can automatically turn off three seconds after touching a control to save power, another nice feature. On transmit, you can monitor yourself, which is nice when wearing headphones, or you can disable this when using the speaker. The mic compression level can be set here from one to 100. And like the CW Vox, a voice Vox is adjustable in 100 millisecond steps from 100 milliseconds up to five seconds. You can also disable the voice Vox. You can also set the trigger level of the Vox here. You can adjust the EQ on your voice transmissions, accentuating the low, high or mid ranges. But I have to say I had great audio reports with this disabled. The squelch threshold can be set here at a value from 0 to 100 for both AM and FM. Gain TX Digi controls the audio gain in digital modes. It's also possible to remove AM FM as an option on each band. And those are the available options on version 1 of the LD11 software. Further options may become available in later upgrades. The final thing I'd like to show you in this short overview of the LD11 features is the band scope. But let me just take a moment here to also mention the display. This is a 40 by 27 millimeter backlit LCD. That's approximately one and five eighths inch by about an inch roughly, and has a resolution of 128 by 64 pixels. This is a great screen. It's simple to view in bright light and dark conditions and great for portable ops where the radio may be sat on the ground some distance away from your face. All the key information is displayed in a clear way on the screen. Now the band scope. This can be turned on and off by pressing the blue function button followed by the VFO button. This simple scope gives a visual representation of signals 24 kilohertz above and below you, so you get a 48 kilohertz view of the spectrum in total. Tuning around you can see peaks of nearby signals. Changing modes you can see different bandwidths of each mode displayed in the band scope. When changing the filter settings, you can see the bandwidth of the pass band change in the bandscape. Here I've selected AM and I'm switching between the different filter settings. OK, that's a lightning tour of the key features. I think LNR have a great little offering here. The LD11 is both small and light, but its performance seems very good and it's packed with all the features you'd expect with a modern radio. I was pleased with the on-air performance and comments and it was nice to have just a little more power available than one might get from alternative QRP or portable radios in this price range. On the test bench into a dummy load, I'm seeing between four and seven watts using just 12 volts and between about five and eight watts using 13.8 volts with 80 up to 20 meters consistently outputting the higher power. If you're building a portable or soda station, this is definitely worth your consideration. Okay, 73s guys, get out there and enjoy your radio.